Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Joe Camerly. Uh, we're going to be talking today about building Capture the Flag in use for security training for non-security people. I am a product security engineer at Salesforce. Uh, I am not speaking on behalf of Salesforce. Uh, don't take anything that I say as investment recommendations. We are a publicly traded company. I'm not talking anything about financials. Don't base your retirement on me. Uh, I will be talking about things that Salesforce has published on the engineering blog and in a few other places because I have been a participant of actually building CTFs for doing security training for both Salesforce customers as well as Salesforce engineers. Uh, there will be an interactive component to this talk because I'm working on getting ways of the audience involved. So I will be asking at various times if you want to type things into the Discord chat. I've got it up on my other screen. I'll do my best to keep up with that while still talking. And with that, we can go ahead and jump right into it. There are three main things that I want to cover today for the purposes of this talk. We're going to talk about the why, the what, and the how. The idea is to give you enough of a framework to take this back to your companies, back to your own uh, personal lives, however you want to use the uh, ideas that we've come up with to enhance security training, make it a little bit more memorable, make it a little more interactive, and really get more benefit because honestly, eyes forward, slideshows by security people until your eyeballs fall out, doesn't seem to be an effective way of informing, especially developers on security topics and getting that information into their heads so that they use it again in the future. <clears throat> so this is an idea that a couple of us had at Salesforce. Uh, CTF competitions have been a staple of security event for years. I love it. Uh, they're fun. They're competitive ways of showing off your skills. I personally find it useful because uh, I use them as a learning tool. I've learned about vulnerabilities. I've learned about techniques. It's given me incentive to find things out. Uh, we find it very useful in general in the application security field. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about gamification and, you, and how it's useful to attract and retain attention, and how we've been struggling to get all these AppSec concepts to be retained and brought forth again when the developers are actually writing code. So we decided to build some games around Capture and use Capture the Flag as the game model for doing security training. This is not just something that was decided on a whim and said, hey, Capture the Flags are fun, let's do it. We actually did do our best to put science and research behind this. I'm sure many of you have seen the learning pyramid or the cone of experience out there. Uh, this is widely circulated and also broadly debunked set of research. One thing that you'll notice is looking at those pyramids is those percentages are awfully suspiciously round numbers. And that, you know, reading is 10%, you only retain 10% of what you read. That's arguably not true at all. Broad base of our learning comes from reading. And if we were only recalling 10%, it's really uh, at odds with our day-to-day -day experiences. So a few years ago, Cisco put together this survey, Multimodal Learning Through Media. Uh, this is an actual scientifically based survey. They did deep research, worked with education experts, uh, performed experiments, and have a uh, quite a bit of resources put into this. It's an awesome, awesome paper. Uh, I strongly recommend taking a look at it. Uh, reading through it, it was it formed the basis of a lot of our thoughts around shaping our programs, uh, as well as if you really want to get a chuckle, there's some really fun educational specialists that deconstruct the learning pyramid in hilarious ways. What we picked up from the uh, the research in the Cisco papers is how to build CTFs and use them as a learning tool. Uh, we're focusing specifically on two different technical audiences. And for the purposes of this talk, I'll talk mostly about that. Uh, the first audience are Salesforce customers. Salesforce is software as a service. We actually build a platform. It has a shared security model. You 
um, our customers can actually write code that executes on our systems in our environment. So they are, our customers are partly responsible for the security of their systems. If they do something bad programmatically, it can expose holes to their, and expose their data through no fault of Salesforce. The other audience that we tend to focus on are internal developers. Salesforce is a product company. We build complex, complicated, app, mostly web-based applications. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of engineers writing more and more stuff every day, and we want them to write in the most secure way possible. We want them to take these learnings and really incorporate them. A third audience that I'll touch on a little bit through this talk is some of the work I've done with uh, teenagers and uh, lesser experienced people who are interested in technology field and using capture the flags in order to get uh, teens really more interested in technology in general and security specifically. The next generation of security engineers has to come from somewhere, right? Uh, the main thing we wanted to take into account is this uh, square here of the different types of learning and what skills they're most relevant to. Coding and security topics in coding are complex skills. It's not something that's a basic skill. So we're more important, we're more worried about the second column there, the higher order skills and how to get the most bang for a buck in getting the concepts taught, retained, and then used in practice. And we found that the interactive model of multimodal learning is our highest uh, bang for the buck. It's our highest return on investment and it gives us uh, our students the best chance for success. Multimodal learning consists of many different principles. There are eight of them there on the right-hand side. We'll talk about some of the other ones that we used as well, but for now we're gonna talk to, uh, specifically about the direct manipulation principle. Something that's hands-on, something that's meaningful. We wanna give people something that they can do and have that actual benefit of doing something as a part of learning it. That seems to be a fairly effective way. For this, uh, we wanted to build something that our players can actually build upon. Uh, and again, we have two separate audiences. So what do we do for the customer facing audience at Salesforce where most of our customers are Salesforce administrators and developers? We built a capture the flag specifically around Salesforce technologies and tooling uh, where we would give someone a deliberately insecure Salesforce environment and issue them a set of challenges that they had to go through to make that environment more secure. For our internal developers, <coughs> we needed something that was uh, a little more developer focused that we could build on. Uh, while we do incorporate some of the Salesforce as a platform challenges in there, we wanted something that was more technically um, relevant to their day-to-day -day work. Again, it should be relevant to their to their work. So we started with using uh, OWASP Juice Shop as our basis for our internal development challenges, uh, partly because it's a fun little application. It already has a capture the flag mode and supports a lot of interesting uh, concepts that we wanted our developers to learn. So by giving our players the ability to directly manipulate a real world experience, that is performing all the steps required to secure something that is not secure, it's going to reinforce that behavior and ensures that uh, all of our players are going to be learning in the way that's got the highest measured success rate. As I said, we have three different types of audiences uh, with various levels of security experience. Uh, we built internally. This is a plan that we put in place uh, before COVID-19 hit. <clears throat> uh, there is, has been at Salesforce for many years, a onboarding process for new engineers where they get two weeks of boot camp of coming on board, learning Salesforce tooling and technologies. There was always a significant amount of security training built into that. Uh, traditionally, it had been a product security engineer going and lecturing and then having a handful of scattered exercises for the play, for the participants to practice on. When we rebuilt the program, we incorporated Capture the Flag as a central part of it. So now our new employees come on board, they get their training and they're immediately challenged with, 
here you're now competing against the rest of the of the students in your training cohort for fun for prizes for bragging rights by performing these security actions and it's really brought engagement up uh, and again on the customer facing side we are at salesforce we're putting on a number of customer facing conferences and wanted to target those audiences with the uh, platform specific challenges our goal is using that gamification in order to increase knowledge. We want to increase knowledge by increasing interaction. In order to do this, we wanted to have something that's approachable and easy to use. We know that we're competing for limited time and attention. No one has enough time today to do everything they need. Uh, we can't just give them you know, some fun pitch of, hey, come do security stuff. It's fun. It's not always going to catch attention. We want the entire experience to be smooth and engaging. We wanna keep them involved in this. The longer we can keep them involved, the more topics they're going to be going into and the more that they're actually going to be learning and using. To that extent, we integrated everything as much as possible uh, so that everyone could have a smooth experience and minimize the amount of flipping between windows, changing contexts, uh, measuring their learning, measuring their successes, uh, minimizing the amount of changes they have to do lets us maximize the time we have to teach them things. Uh, one reason for keeping it as integrated and immersive as possible is at the customer specific ones, this is what we are competing against. We are trying to do security training while there are thousands and thousands of distractions that our players could be looking at and doing other things. So we have to keep them involved, keep them interested. This is where we got to draw on our research once again, using the uh, multimodal uh, configurations, uh, looked at some of the other principles. So keeping things together in space, keeping things together in time, uh, keeping things uh, represented in a single way, so not making them do multiple things to accomplish the same goal. We, we are building all of these principles into how we are developing and targeting our capture the flag challenges to make them relevant, to keep them together and to keep our players involved with the minimum of overhead. I won't go into a lot of detail on the overall architecture of some of the things we built. Uh, I did write some blog, blog posts on the Salesforce engineering blog. Uh, they're out there and available if you wanna see some more in-depth writing about the actual technologies that we used. <clears throat> sufficient to say we did uh, build, of course, the Salesforce focused challenges on the Salesforce platform. I uh, have some nice APIs that we wrote running in Heroku. We built on CTFD open source uh, capture the flag scoring system as our platform. And again, more details are available in the blog post, but to keep things uh, as easy to use as possible and as integrated, I will walk you through what we call our integrated challenges. This is how our customers and anyone else can interact with our Salesforce-based challenges for uh, for finding and capturing flags. So it starts with registration. You register yourself with CTFD. Our first integration is that then behind the scenes, we create a trial instance for that user and they get sent an email where they have to verify their account, log in, they bang, they have a Salesforce, um, what we call a Salesforce organization. It's just uh, an instance of Salesforce that's used for them that they have full access to. They're presented with a series of challenges. Uh, there's a set of trivia challenges as well as hands-on interactive challenges because there is some period of time that it takes for the Salesforce backend to spin up. So this is one, an example of one of our administrative level challenges. We're giving the user the information that they need that their Salesforce organization is probably vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. They need to go and figure out the right way to make it secure. They go into the platform, do the right thing by clicking the checkbox, and they don't have to do anything other than be in the capture the flag system and say, verify. There's API calls that happen behind the scene. We inspect and make sure they did the right thing. If they did do the right thing and they solved that challenge, we give them their flag, they submit it, and they get their points. 
they go on the leaderboard, easy peasy. They have a maximum of two browser tabs that they have to work in, and the same workflow takes place no matter what challenges they're doing. With that, we had some really good participation uh, last year at our Dreamforce conference. We had hundreds and hundreds of players come by and actually sit and play. In my opinion, the sheer numbers of players is not necessarily as relevant as this other fun measure, which is the amount of time that our players spent involved playing Capture the Flag. Either median or average time, looking at these numbers, we're getting tens of minutes and sometimes an hour on average of our players interacting with Capture the Flag. Think about the last time you went to an in-person conference with thousands and thousands of your closest friends and you spent 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour involved with any one thing. It's probably very unlikely unless you were working in another Capture the Flag. Again, the average number of questions and engagement that we got from our players was very significant. They are, um, while we did have a few players just come in, answer one or two and go off and do other things, a large number of our players actually did participate to a great depth and, and made this something that they were very interested in. <clears throat> we have different categories of challenges and all this is out in the blogs. So I'm not gonna cover a lot of it because we have a lot of other things to cover, but we do try and make it as broad based and as interesting as possible. Which brings me to audience considerations. You need to, when you're building these capture the flags, one thing that you'll need to unlearn if you've built CTFs for security people is that you need to take into account your audience, what their level of comfort is with technology, what their learning goals are to get out of this experience. This is not just uh, put the most brain teasers that you can out there that will frustrate a lot of people. Uh, I've learned that uh, many in the general population are not as crazy as us security folks when it comes to, I wanna find out the most mind bending way possible to do something, you know, make it so obscure, so difficult that the fun is in the hunt. It's not necessarily the case for a lot of other people. Take into account your audience as you're targeting your capture the flag. And if you're going to do something for developers versus business people versus, as I said, I've done some work with teenagers before. It really is a way of piquing their interest, but it can't be too frustrating. <clears throat> Step one is building our challenges, how we're going to determine what set of challenges are appropriate to put into a CTF. There are a number of considerations that you need to keep in mind. And again, this is where it differs from a security player CTF, we are not making this obscure. We are not um, building this as a tool for, I know the most obscure set of vulnerabilities that I can chain together to break into this particular thing. This is a, a learning and teaching tool. So we wanna keep a number of things in mind, especially the appropriateness, the difficulty, and the playability of our challenges. <clears throat> I have a set of five criteria to keep in mind uh, that I recommend that we work on as we are building our challenges, uh, just ways of making sure that what we are building is going to be useful and that it will captivate and engage people versus presenting them with something that's difficult to understand and it's going to put them off. Speaking of putting them off, there are some red flags that you need to be aware of when building out your challenges. Three major ones that I've come up with are listed here on the slide, things that uh, you want to tend to avoid unless you have a really good reason for putting that sort of a challenge in. And especially the relevancy one. We are building tooling that's going to teach people things that we want them to take back in their day-to-day -day -day work. So, while <clears throat> stenographic challenges may be interesting and fun, unless your developers are doing something like that and as part of their day-to-day -day work, it's probably not relevant. Things that you want to focus on more probably, injection attacks, 
cross-site scripting, any of those categories of vulnerabilities where you've noticed your developers need to have a little bit of remedial education and, and to bring that into their coding. Challenge building doesn't work well in isolation. <laughs> uh, collaboration is a great way to build challenges. Collaborating within your team, it helps you to stay focused. It helps you to um, think of what your most prevalent security issues are in your organization, and then you target the challenges that way. So you plan out what you're going to build. You work with others. You can actually work across teams, across groups to see what else, uh, what other areas of the company may want to contribute to this, which is great because then you get extra challenges with no additional work. Uh, you really want to stay focused. You want to limit your challenges to the small number of specific themes. And if you are building capture the flags, I'll talk about some tooling <coughs> later on uh, that makes it much easier to build consistent, repeatable capture the flag environments and tune them appropriately so you can collaborate and have a library of different systems of different uh, focused areas that are appropriate for different audiences and use them when you need to and where you need to. I came from the developer world. I am a huge proponent of agile techniques. So collaboration, collaborative building of things, testing, reflection on that, having regular retrospectives, and then iterating on your content to hone your challenges is extremely effective. It, it helps you to um, to build and focus much better when you're working with others and to have that feedback cycle and to have that continual improvement process, uh, especially because you, then your challenges don't get stale and you keep them relevant. So this is not just a one and done process. This is going to be evolving over time. Uh, late, and again, later on when we talk about the how, we'll talk about some of the technology that's out there that can really help you to, to be effective with this. This is the point in the talk where if we were all in the room together, I would have you stand up, move around, get into groups, and do a little bit of interactive and collaborative challenge design. Unfortunately, we can't do that, but this is where the Discord channel is going to come in handy. What I would like you to do, if you'd like, is to, we're gonna take a few minutes, and I want you to think about what might be a good challenge for your particular audience you have in mind, whether you're thinking of developers at your company, uh, teenagers that you wanna teach topics to, business people at your company. Come up with a challenge idea, something that you think meets the criteria of relevancy, that's appropriate, that's interesting, that's solvable, that um, has concepts that you wanna reinforce while avoiding your red flags. And um, go ahead and type something into track one on the Discord channel so that everyone can see what those ideas are. This is also nice because it gives me a short break from talking. All right, I see a couple of people typing, so that's awesome. And as I said, I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end of this. I'm also available on Twitter, I'm out there on LinkedIn and everywhere else. So this is, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm always happy to talk about it. 
So we had someone who did some work with high school kids, and little to no networking experience, network focused challenges. That would be a really interesting one, um, especially thinking about how to incorporate flags into that. Uh, another idea, I have three similar leads with keywords as a clue. Absolutely, uh, picking out keywords is interesting. Uh, and making things as hands-on and relevant as possible is what we found is uh, a way of building success. The last time I did this in person at a Salesforce focus conference, I had one guy who spent most of the day on the CTF, and he was so excited, so happy about it. He actually ended up uh, winning it, but he came up to me near the end, and he's like, this has been great. I've learned so much today, although it's going to be a little hard to explain to my boss why I spent all day at one spot instead of going around the rest of the conference, to which, of course, I replied, well, just tell your boss, you know, you didn't go around to all the other areas of the conference, but you did get a great tour of all of the security features, many of the security features that are available to you. So, so it wasn't just doing one very focused thing. It was kind of broad based, but very specific on the uh, security features that they needed to know for day-to-day -day work. Swift coding, using it to keep engaged. How do we track and manage challenges that are, as they're being developed? Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that and how, but basically what I have and what's out there that I open sourced are some tools. Uh, we use YAML files uh, for doing our collaboration. So we've got Git repositories that have the various challenges in them. We use YAML files. People collaborate on writing challenges. And then I have a set of tooling that pre-processes those YAML files, converts them into CTFD format, and some other tooling that CTFD is, will spins up and automatically imports them. So we can, I've got a continuous integration, continuous deployment process set, so I can push a button and kick out a fully functional CTF. So those, those links will be in the slides and elsewhere as well. Awesome. As I said, making it easy to participate is key. We want to be able to make the enrollment as friction-free as possible. You want to make it as easy. So uh, in terms of customer focused at conferences, it's a very easy registration process. Other audience types like the internal security training that we have at Salesforce, we've got a little bit more leverage over the people in that this is now part of your job, so your job requirements are to sit here and participate in the CTF for the next couple hours. Uh, planning out how you're going to get people onboarded, getting their tooling together is, is, uh, is a critical part of success. And honestly, now that Burp has the integrated browser, newer versions of Burp has made our job so much easier because uh, traditionally that was one of the hardest things of teaching anyone in these these capture the flags and security trainings is getting developers to set their proxy right and getting the uh, the proxy certs trust on their system. So I'm so happy that Burp's got that built in, and that's really a, helped with our onboarding and enrollment. <clears throat> Integration is another pillar, uh, making it very easy to participate by making a smooth, seamless set of steps and as few steps as possible for people to become successful. Anything that has an API is an ideal candidate for integration uh, where you can have backend services that can use metadata to examine whatever environment you're in and determine whether the player has met the goals of the challenge or not. Uh, this is something we're doing for Salesforce. We don't just have flag values hidden within the Salesforce instance because the player could just go and find them and not actually have to do anything to solve the challenge. The actual flag values are stored in our backend APIs that validate that the, the player did the right thing. This is something that you can take to cloud providers, you can take to AWS, Azure, GCP, uh, and if you're running stacks on Docker, Kubernetes, other software as a service platforms that have sets of APIs where you can inspect metadata, 
you can make focus challenges that have this integrated verification step so that your players have an easier time of getting their flag values. And, <clears throat> and again, that is something that is open source in the repository. Uh, at the top of the screen, there was a little CTFD plugin that we wrote and released. To make it uh, engaging for people to participate, you have to have good scoring. It has to be understandable, it has to be meaningful. You want your scoring to reinforce the goals that you're looking to accomplish. You want, also wanna maximize interaction. It's not just, shouldn't just be winner take all, and you wanna make it so that players at the range of technical levels that you're targeting are participating. So someone who's less familiar with the tooling technology and someone who's a little more familiar should both have ways that they can engage, they can get on a scoreboard and honestly have a potential to win. Whether it's you know the top X players get this you know, nicer prize and will pick random uh, participants that meet a minimum bar of scoring, that's a great way of encouraging people to have that set of participation and that they don't have to be the top scorer in order to get some reinforcement and uh, be able to have that recognition of playing. This is another thing that I'd like to ask if anyone has ideas. I'm not gonna pause, but if you do have some ideas of interesting things that you can think of for reinforcing this type of behavior and scoring, you can feel free to put it in the Discord channel uh, so that everyone else can see it. Uh, but definitely <clears throat> avoid a one winner take all mentality. It does not help encourage other players uh, to maximize their participation. You need to build interest for this, not just from your target audience and from your own team, but across the board. You wanna get buy-in and sponsorship from your leadership. This is going to be something that takes time and effort to develop. This is not something that you can just get off the shelf especially if you're targeting a certain audience. There is an ROI behind this, and if you can demonstrate that to good management, they will absolutely be on board. Your, your return on investment is this ability to show, you know, we are teaching people security topics, and you can pull metrics out of just about any CTF scoring system and, and be able to come up with numbers for you. We are getting some good engagement. We are getting some interest as well as getting, you'll always get those good anecdotal data points as well. Every time uh, we run a capture the flag, which is every few weeks we're onboarding new engineers, uh, we usually get feedback from at least one or more of that group saying, this was so much fun. I stayed up until 5 a.m. because I was so involved in it. Uh, so we have all those anecdotal data points as well. You will need to have some resources. You'll need time. You'll need money, uh, you'll need other people's time. So you wanna work with other groups. You wanna have play testers involved. So either within your team, uh, some of the leads, maybe your security champions to help play test. You want them to have the ability to have that exclusive time to focus on play testing, feedback and improvement. Uh, <clears throat> now with the entire COVID situation, uh, this is absolutely great because no one can be in the same room to as much of an extent as possible. So this works well remotely. Uh, players can play from anywhere they are in the world. This is great uh, for virtual conferences as well. We're playing Capture the Flag here. Uh, most other events do, and you don't need to be anywhere other than on the internet. You want to have this great discussion of how to build these ideas out work with other groups and communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, communicate up the chain with management, what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're progressing. <clears throat> communicate across your level. Maybe look at working with other teams. You can engage other teams in your company uh, for building challenges. If you have something like a, GR, a risk management group, a GRC group, infrastructure, networking, anyone can contribute to this. And what you'll get out of it are a set of challenges that you can have in a single CTF or across multiple CTFs 
that cover a broad range of interest at the company. And that's also a way to build that collaboration. Think about how you can publicize this. This is something you really want to draw attention to. Uh, you want to get people interested about it. You want them to be aware of it. You want to bring them into play. And then you also want to communicate after the fact of recognizing those people that have participated, recognizing people that have done well, as well as uh, doing your best to recognize across the board. Be open about what your expectations and results are. This is not a cure-all, nothing is ever perfect. Some of the measurements may be slightly fuzzy. You know, engagement time is one thing, but that doesn't necessarily always track with they're learning everything, but you should, you'll you normally get that level of interest from your players and they'll, they'll be interested and involved in it. It is something that not a lot of other people have done, so it's usually something that's unique and interesting. Having the right incentives is key. Uh, competition is an incentive, um, but other things can help. You want to make your incentivization as inclusive as possible so that you're not discouraging people. Um, think about how you can have multiple levels of reward so that you're encouraging everyone to participate to at least a minimal level. So maybe have some sort of staggered sets of levels of if you can manage to get so many thousands of points, you'll get virtual swag, you'll get a you know a badge on the employee leaderboard, you get so many thousand more, you get something else. Uh, <clears throat> this is really an area that is specific to your particular time, your particular circumstances, and what your leadership is comfortable with doing. I don't know that it always, I don't, wouldn't say that it should be money. It should be something um, It's not quite as transactional as that. One thing that I've seen as fun is issuing challenge coins. So people that make a certain level on the CTF are eligible to get a challenge coin, something that's not really commonplace across developers, development organizations, something that we're familiar with in the security space. And it can be an interesting way to get people a little bit more involved because you are like, what's this challenge coin? They get this little shiny piece of bling and it makes them want to go and get more and learn more. As I said, competition is good to a certain extent. We want to make it fun, but not bloodthirsty. Keep in mind that people are different. Different people have different motivations. There are some people that actually seek out public recognition. Other people want to shy back a little bit and not really be called out individually. Participating in the CTF usually requires some amount of competitiveness. We want to make it friendly. Uh, this is, I love this gift. This is a uh, belt sander racing. It's an event. I think it's in Vermont. These people put it on every year and you have to sit on a belt sander and race. It's a fun race. There's a little bit of competition, but it's mostly about having fun. You can also encourage teamwork, have collaborative challenges. Um, <clears throat> there is a technical conference that happens every January, except for this one in uh, Sandusky, Ohio, at a water park called Code Mesh. Every year they put on a capture the flag and there are collaborative challenges. There's a whole Slack group dedicated to it. Players help each other out with the challenges. Uh, there's quite a few, it's a general developer conference. Um, some of the challenges involve cryptography, various encodings and that, and there's an open channel. Um, those of us who are in the security space do our best to collaborate with developers, give them hints, point newbies in the right direction for solving their problem. Uh, do I encourage players with more skill to play a mentorship role to new players? Absolutely. That is an outstanding idea. Uh, internally, when we're doing this capture the flag training, uh, there is always a security person who leads the training, and that person is available for consultation. They do, they do their best to work with the developers. Uh, if there is anyone who gets stuck on a particular thing, we give them hints and ideas as to how to solve the right challenge. On that note, making your challenges the appropriate level of difficulty. 
Interesting and engaging, yes. Impossible to solve, probably not, unless you've got one bonus question that you wanna make nearly impossible to solve just for those people who may really wanna stretch themselves. Focus on your specific audience, even if it means cutting down a number of challenges, making things too broad, making them too easy, too complicated, you're gonna undermine your CTF success. Uh, maximize your end goal of internalized knowledge, not frustration. Keeping your scoring uh, difficulty versus reward. You wanna have appropriate motivation for people on getting points on a board tends to internally motivate quite a number of people. Make the points reflective of the difficulty of challenge of, of the challenge. Uh, make sure that you do have a good distribution of challenge difficulty. Something for the newer, less experienced people to participate easily in, and a set of things that are a little bit higher value that maybe are a stretch for them, but really can give them that that drive to look into it and do some research. Uh, this is also where your challenges can branch out beyond something that's just a technical challenge, something that involves collaboration with another team, with, with groups, with departments. Uh, one of our processes internally is there is a secure software development lifecycle at Salesforce, like I'm sure there is at most of your other companies. There is an onboarding process where changes that the development teams are developing, they have to submit for a security assessment. Uh, in the onboarding, and this dev boot camp, we lead the entire group in completing a challenge to uh, go through the process of creating this security assessment and submitting it so that there is this uh, group learnings taking place. And it's something that everyone participates in. And at the end of it, everyone gets a flag. So it's a nice way to get their points on the board. It introduces them to other people in the group and can really help build that collaboration for these uh, new engineers that don't really, may not know a lot of other people. It's a great introduction for them to meet other people on the call because they're now not in the same room with them. You wanna follow up on this. Uh, this is a follow up for communication. Make it, uh, do a lot of follow ups after the event. Poll people, find out how you can uh, measure their interest, measure their success. This is not just helpful to Bring that feedback in for the next time around. You can take this and again, use the anecdotes, use the data, show that this is uh, interesting, engaging. You've got that return on investment that is uh, justifying the use of security budget on this. Think about how you can use the buzz from this to build on it as a feedback mechanism. Have goals to have multiple CTFs with increasing levels of difficulty, maybe have elimination rounds. There's all sorts of different things you can do to uh, use this feedback to build excitement for the next round and doing this over and over again, using tools is actually pretty straightforward. <clears throat> this is also a really fun way because there are never enough people in security. Think about it. You know who the people who are most involved in this is, who are the most interested and engaged. They're ideal candidates if you have a security champion program. You've just now got a really great way of identifying security champions. More than that, you've probably got a way of uh, poaching engineers that are really good at security to come over to the dark side and actually get paid full time to do security. Get people who are that interested, you know, do a little internal recruiting with it. Doesn't hurt. Making it easy to run. So this is where it gets, uh, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, it's not just fun and games. It takes a lot of effort to build a CTF. We've already got so much work. How are we gonna be able to fit this in? Uh, we fit this in by minimizing the amount of effort and friction ever in any place possible. We wanna make this smooth, we wanna make this easy. And of course, the first thing is authoring challenges. I talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, we threw some ideas out in, in the uh, channel, but we wanna have a way of building, collaborating. Like I said, there are, uh, in the resources, there are some examples of how we're building them internally using YAML. 
Uh, you can use Markdown, you can use whatever, but we have a structured set and then a set of tools for converting that easier to collaborate on artifacts into a CTF that's fully functional with the minimum amount of human interaction required. <coughs> and playing the same thing over and over again is gonna get boring. So you do wanna be able to plan for your CTF to grow, change and evolve over time. So it should be something you can easily update. Uh, keeping that integration in place is great. Keeping that code updated. Uh, using tooling that already supports what you need to do, whether it's a set of APIs, uh, various CTF platforms have different things that they can do for automatically creating environments. Uh, just starting off, Shop is in CTF mode is a great, easy to start tool for getting a very low friction and relatively easy to integrate CTF up and off the ground. Hosting it is always going to be fun. There's a lot of platforms out there. And so we picked CTFD mostly because it fit in with what we were comfortable with and what we're building and has that open source and, and especially the plugin ecosystem. Uh, there are a lot of other frameworks out there. Use what works best for you. That uh, GitHub repo on the screen is a list of CTF resources. Um, really nice to look through and figure things out. Highly recommended that you check it out. And deployment. Minimizing that friction means minimizing the repetitive tasks. We, I've set up continuous integration, continuous development. I can spin up a targeted CTF at the touch of a button. And because Salesforce owns Heroku, I've got a great environment that I can immediately push it out to. Uh, there's also a free tier of Heroku, free tier of so many other cloud providers. So you can very easily and cheaply <coughs> spin up proof of concept environments. But if you're going to invest the time in building a CTF, I strongly recommend investing the time making a continuous integration delivery process, some sort of automation tooling to make it um, so that there's no human interaction going from to go from collaborating on challenges to having a CTF system pop out the other end. The more hands-on work you have to do for that, the less frequently you're going to be able to do this and the harder it's going to be and it's just going to get to be too difficult for everyone to do. So having repeatable CTFs in stable environments lets you spend the minimum amount of effort to get the maximum amount of success. We've, I have this set up right now. We can spin up these environments. Uh, make sure that your environment is aligned with policies and requirements. If you're building challenges that have sensitive uh, properties of them, if you're working with internal systems, if you're working with anything that may have particular uh, privacy ramifications, don't expose your CTF out to the internet at large. Make sure you set the appropriate boundaries for accessing your CTF system, whatever works for that particular scenario. Uh, keep in mind, remember, you're exposing information in the CTF, so you wanna make sure that the accesses are appropriately controlled. Some of the tools that um, I use for developing this, the tool sets are built on Core CTFD, which is built on Python, uh, Node, and various APIs is the, some of the platform for, uh, for the API section. Use a, do a lot of testing on Docker and Heroku. Everything out there is free, nearly free, or really easy to use uh, for just about any environment that you can think of. I did a hands-on lab version of this talk uh, this past winter at RSA, uh, that GitHub repos out there. It's a set of utilities and some documentation for them that you can use as a starting point if you want to use CTFD and if you want to use the data representations that I've settled on, or you can take it as inspiration and go off your own way. It's just some basic node scripts, basic, uh, transformations, and then it's all hosted on Heroku if you want, or Docker if you wanna just run it locally. So now we have our easy to collaborate, easy to run environment. We wanna make sure that it's effectively used. Again, this is not just having fun. We want to reinforce those learning principles, teach those skills, reinforce it. 
uh, having the appropriate metrics and measurements is going to help us to demonstrate our success and justify why we have that money. This is going to be something that's ongoing. When you wrap up one, you can go ahead and start on the next one. We're going to build on that communication. Um, when you run one successful event, you might, you know, it may encourage you to run even more. Usually, if you start playing CTFs, you go out and you start looking for even more. Uh, this is something that I found applies to me for building them as well. I built one and then I wanted to go and build more. So make sure that you're you have those. Uh, processes in place to accept that feedback, to incorporate it, follow up with players, build and update challenges. And again, going from the finish line of one right into the start of your next one, keep that momentum going. So we have all this, we wanna be able to communicate effectively. How do we convince management that what we're doing has that value? What else, what more do managers like than dashboards? Shining graphs, bits of information, statistics. Most of the CTF platforms, you can very easily extract that information out of, use it to build graphs and charts to demonstrate uh, whatever measures of success you're using to reinforce these concepts. I'm approaching the end of my time, so we did cover the why, the what, and the how. We're incorporating formalized learning principles. Uh, we are building on successes. We are defining our metrics. We know that we want to increase security knowledge. We want to keep it top of mind. We want to improve the retention of their concepts. We're doing that by keeping the audience in mind, building relevant, appropriate, interesting, engaging, solvable challenges. We are avoiding obscurity. We're avoiding non-relevant uh, challenges. We are avoiding something that's too open-ended and has too many potential solutions. We're collaborating on our challenge building. We're reaching out across teams. We're making our capture the flag easy to use. We're making it easy to get into. We're making it straightforward, minimal effort, minimal context switches. We're making it easy to run for ourselves so that we ourselves as executors of it have minimal amount of overhead in creating these environments and running them. We want reusable pipeline. We want consistent deployments. We want to make it effective. We want to have our measurements. We want good metrics. We want to have an iterative process so that we can take what we've learned and build it back. We want to be able to clearly communicate our results. And we've covered the how, how we can build challenges. There's tooling that's out there that we can use. There are blog posts that I've written. There will be more coming on how we're doing this. We have this automate the ability to automate our build and deployment. We have our hosting. We want to make sure our access control is in place. Uh, if we want to enhance our experience, there are ways of customizing all of those CTF platforms for doing, making things easier. Uh, so many different dashboard toolings. You can use your existing BI tools. Uh, and what is one ultimate goal? Having a self-provisioning process where you can have a team that wants to do a team building exercise, be able to come in, push a button and be issued. OK, here is your CTF environment with your, you know, with a set of challenges so that they can have inner team uh, challenges, across team challenges, something that lets people very easily uh, have a fully provisioned environment. If you like this and you want to take it back with you, there are uh, three things that you can do for next week, three months from now, and within six months, I'm not going to go through these, but these are steps to success that I feel are appropriate and achievable within those time spans. Uh, gives you a great set of tooling to have as a part of your security curriculum. With that, I am done talking. There's a set of resources here. Like I said, there's some open source work that uh, Salesforce has contributed out to the universe. I'm very grateful to them for letting me write that and then releasing it out as open source. Uh, the learning resources are there, blog posts are there, CTFD resources, and then a few of my own personal scripts that I open source myself that you can use as a basis for building CTFs. With that, uh, I will go ahead and wrap up. If there are any other questions, please feel free to type them out and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for 
attending besides Boston, and I'm available anytime. I'll have the slides uh, updated and posted in the slide channel after this.